Hey guys, Mr. Bostic here. Welcome back to Ancient History. And uh, this will be our opportunity to go over the material that you've taken a look at already, plus a little bit more for Rome. Uh, just based on the nature of what's been going on this year, um, this may have more detail than we are going to have to cover. Clearly, we've, you know, we've had very little time with it, but we can't finish our, our year on Ancient History without giving, giving it a good shot to go through Rome in a little bit more thorough way. So... Without much more ado, let's go ahead and get started. Just let me remind you that um, if I'm going a little quickly for you, feel free to pause as you're watching. And, you know, so you can take note of some of what's said on the screen that I'm not totally covering. And please feel free to go and take a look again at the video on the YouTube channel if, uh, if you feel like you need to review some of the sections. All right. So let's get started, guys. All right. Rome is very famously known as the Eternal City, and that has meant different things at different times. You know, in the ancient world, the fa simple fact of the matter was that Rome came to mean so much to so many people that people couldn't really imagine the uh, the the idea that Rome wouldn't always be the the important, powerful, central place that it had become. Now, since then. It's, it's come to mean a, a certain different thing, really, with the religious importance of Rome. But in a certain even cultural sense, though Rome has quit being the world empire it was at one time, in a certain sense, we are still Romans. Uh, we use their alphabet. We use their calendar with only a slight adjustment that happened a few centuries ago. We, you know, it, the... So, so much of our language, 60% of the English language comes from, out of words that came from their language. It, Europe wouldn't make any sense without Rome. The, it, in some ways, like I said, we really are still Romans. So let's go ahead and proceed. All right, now to begin with, I mean, we got to keep in mind for Rome that they have really, you could say, two legendary beginnings or foundings. The first founding is the founding of, you could say, the Roman people, because they claimed to be descended from the Trojan hero Aeneas, um, who fled, um, according to the legends, with, with the help of, of Zeus, fled the destruction of Troy and wandered around only later to end up in Italy. Right? But in a more direct sense, they, they very much claim descent from the twins Romulus and Remus, who themselves were defended, descended from Aeneas and, you know, who had been raised, uh, well, without getting fully into the story, their mother was forced to become a Vestal Virgin by their uncle who had unjustly taken over ruler, rulership of a nearby kingdom in the Alban Hills and forced their mother to become a Vestal Virgin. But to her, Mars, the god of war, appeared. And she became pregnant, not with one, but with two children. And the evil uncle had them taken off to be killed, but they were placed in the river Tiber, right? And washed up on the shore and were nursed by the she-wolf that you see here in the middle. And all of these things being, of course, very symbolic. You know, that, that Vesta, who, a Vestal virgin, is, is a major priestess of Vesta. Vesta is the goddess of the heart, of the family, the, kind of the warm center of the home. Mars god of war, right? Here they are, the children of, of both, in a sense, and being nursed by a she-wolf, who's, you know, kind of a ferocity. Right? It, the, all of these things sort of symbolically represent the kind of character of Romans and the people who descend from, from this founding. Right? Now, let's keep in mind, you know, where we're talking about. Rome is centered on the west coast of the Italian peninsula <clears throat> in an area called Latium which really means the region of the Latins, or in a certain sense, wide, like wide fields, right? And along the River Tiber, now right, not right at the mouth of the River Tiber, at the mouth of the River Tiber, Rome eventually sets up a coastal city, Ostia, but just up the river, at the first good place that it's easy to cross the river, which, as often happens, it's a place where there's an island in the middle. Now, to begin with, Rome is just a village, right? And a, a center... A small village centered here on seven hills, right? Famously so. Let's back up a second, though. 
the uh, you know, and their northern neighbors, the Etruscans, were much more advanced in terms of their civilization than Rome was to begin with. And for that matter, in the south of the Italian peninsula, you have a lot of Greeks, right? That so much of the Romans called this area Magna Graecia, right? So there are lots of other people in the Italian peninsula, and Rome, especially to begin with, was definitely not the most auspicious area, the most powerful, the most well-developed civilization. Right? And they tended to be dominated in their early years by their northern neighbors, the Etruscans. Right? Now, you know, Rome famously was founded on seven hills. We see them here. This is actually a modern map. In, in this modern map, you can see the, uh, the train lines of Termini Station in Rome that exists today. But what they're pointing out here in this brochure is that these hills still carry their ancient names. The Capitoline, the Palatine being the most central. This is why, you know, the center of governance in our country as well, that, you know, where do, where do our rulers meet on the capital? Which, by the way, is a hill, by the way. Um, and Palatine is the origin of the name palace because so many of the most ancient families had their large, impressive houses on the Palatine Hill that palatial or palace comes from that name, okay? We also have, of course, the Quirinal, the Viminal, Esquiline, Caelian, Aventine. Right? All of these names are, are famous throughout history. Right? Furthermore, they had seven kings. I mean, Romulus obviously was the first king who, you know, it, it, we, we talk about the founding of Rome with Romulus and Remus, but the fact is that they disagreed as they were founding a new city and, you know, in the place where they had been suckled by the she-wolf. And... In that disagreement, it became a fight, and Romulus killed Remus, right? So Romulus alone becomes the first king. But there are a series of seven kings, and the most important really ones that we need to know for our purposes are Romulus is the first, and Tarquin, the, notice two of these Indian kings are Tarquins, meaning they're from a Tarquin family, it's, it's an Etruscan family, and they're seen as kind of foreign dominators, right? Especially the last one. Tarquinius Superbus, or Tarquin the Proud, right? So you don't have to get into all the details about the rest of the kings, at least at this point. Right? Numa is most renowned for helping establish the religion of Rome, and we'll, we'll, we can talk a little bit more about that later. But particularly with, you know, with the kings, you need to know that there's seven of them, and you need to know Romulus is the first, and Tarquin the Proud is the last. And that's an important thing for the Romans, because the word king, rex, becomes a hated word of uh, equivalent of tyranny and in as as rome develops its real character in the next phase right now <clears throat> in the roman religion a lot of these deities are going to look familiar to us because the primary deities of rome um, are roughly shared with those of greece so jupiter is zeus juno is hera neptune poseidon etc going down the list I mean, many of these you'd probably already be familiar with. People oftentimes even end up using these names interchangeably, right? But notice only Apollo is the same name, right? It, it's really common to hear people talk about, you know, the Romans as if they ripped everything off of the Greeks and came up with nothing of their own. And I think, honestly, that's a little bit unfair. It's, it's kind of difficult to know in the earliest period of, of history for either of these civilizations um, where exactly they got their ideas and People that had multiple gods very often shared deities back and forth. But the fact is, you go far enough back, and the, both the Romans and the Greeks descend from the same branch prehistorically, uh, culturally speaking. So it's quite possible that both civilizations inherited some of these ideas um, in common, not just that the Romans were, were aping the Greeks and copying them and whatever they did. And I think you know the, the big difference of name. Um, kind of indicates that. But what's what I'd like us to focus on a little bit more here for a second is are, are the deities that are a little more particular to the Romans. Because you know, for example, like Janus, um, the two-headed god, the god of beginnings and endings, therefore the god of doorways, because doorway is a doorway is a beginning of an inside and the end of the outside, or vice versa, it's the end of the inside and the beginning of the outside, right? So it, the, this interesting kind of mid path. Um, mid midway thing is honored by the Romans as a deity, as a kind of divine principle, right? They um, they had household gods, and this is every different household has its own different household gods, um, and gods of the cupboards that would guard the things that you would need to keep, the lares and penates, 
the, the fact they believe that every place has its own genius or kind of a minor god particular to that spot, what makes it special. Um, they have a particular devotion to Vesta. I mean, the Greeks have Vesta. She, her name is Hestia. She's one of the Olympic goddesses. But the Romans have a particular um, devotion to her. And in fact, one of the most pre prestigious um, religious offices throughout Roman history was that of the Vestal Virgins. <clears throat> they had to come from the upper class families. They, uh, they, they were dedicated to, the, to, the, to, to the maintaining the fire of Vesta. Uh, and they were they were given the most prestigious spots in all public events. Uh, it, it, it's a, they have a very special, interesting role for the Romans, um, more emphasized than the Greeks tended to be. Uh, the the Flamines were their priests, but their high priest is the Pontifex Maximus, and that actually means bridge maker. Um, Pontifex. Right um, now, that had to do with the fact that the Romans thought of the river, the Tiber, as a god, right? And to bridge a god. To bridge a river is to kind of bind a god, and so it, it required a religious kind of practice to do so. Right, this is where the name Pontifex comes from. Now, once Rome later, much later on, becomes Christian, that title for the highest priest in Rome, once it's, once it's a Christian priest, um, is placed upon the pope. Right, so if you hear Pontifex now or Pontificate, you know it has to do with the pope. But the ancient origin of that name it comes from the pre-Christian religion of Rome. All right. Now, just quickly, I think it's important for us to mention that in its beginnings, there's a, a lot of violence in Rome, right? Um, it, or uh, maybe I should say two especially violent episodes that are famous in connection with the beginnings of Rome. One, with the beginnings of them founding their family. Remember, this is Romulus gathering in whoever wanted to come in and become a Roman, right? And so mostly he's getting vagabonds and people who have been kicked out of their own cities or possibly thieves, people of questionable background. Um, when Romulus approaches the, the, the their neighbors in the Sabine Hills and you know requests that the, their, these, the fathers allow these new Romans to marry daughters from the Sabines, naturally those fathers are a little suspicious of this rowdy bunch of guys with no women. And so they refused. And the only way that the, the new Romans could get wives and therefore have families in the future was to hold a religious festival and then at a prearranged spot seize the women and take them off to make them their wives now if the, the, tr the traditional name for this is called the rape of the Sabine women but it's not the way we use the word rape now right and the, well not exactly the, the purpose there ultimately is an honorable one to make them their wives and the, the mothers of their future children <clears throat> the next famous and violent beginning is at the is what ends the kingship really because it it's called the rape of Lucretia and this is a rape in the sense that we usually would mean the word because Lucretia was a very famous uh, famously pure and honorable Roman Roman wife of a Roman nobleman and here comes a member of the royal household visiting that Roman nobleman who who forcibly takes advantage of of her and you know out of shame at being dishonored she kills herself right and out of fury that she would be so dishonored the roman nobles rise up against the tarquins kick out tarquin the proud <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> and found the republic and so both of these beginnings the beginning of the city and its families and the beginning of the republic both have this famous name you know connected to them right now the Republic is, you know, the, the one leading the charge in founding the Republic and kicking out the Tarquins, Tarquin the Proud, is Brutus, the first famous Brutus. And he's famous for having said, Seek semper tyrannis, so thus be it always to the tyrant. Right? Now, that is the motto of the state of Virginia now. It was, a, it was a famous quote among our forefathers, specifically because of its place in Roman history here. And that parallel of kicking out kings in the founding of our, our country as well. Right, the, the fight against George the Third of England, <clears throat> but here it became a foundational point of pride for the Romans to get to, that all kingship was smacked of tyranny. That uh, especially in this last example here, and that their pride demanded you know, standing up to the tyrant and and, and kicking him out, right? and that anyone who wanted to be king, Rex, was necessarily a tyrant. And that will come back to bite them 
in, in, in a very famous point in their future history that they'll talk about. Right? But those are foundational moments for, in the Republic. Right. Now, we don't have to get into all the structure of the Republic. Clearly, the, the Rex, the king, is replaced by two consuls. This ought to remind us a little bit of Sparta. And frankly, Rome, in many other ways, should remind us of Sparta because of their, their growing military might. Right? Now, they're not just like the Spartans. They're certainly a lot more cultured and open to culture than Sparta was. But, but they have that kind of military pride, and they replace the king with two consuls. Only the, they're only elected for one year. Right. Um, the senators, the Senate had been around since the kingship. And in fact, it comes from the word Senex, meaning old man. And they were patricians, upper class Romans. Right. Now, there are four other assemblies, um, one organized by families grouping, the other organized by military grouping. Um, the most famous other one that we need to talk about, particularly, is the Concilium Plebis, or the, the peoples or the, the lower class plebeians assembly. Right, and who eventually had protectors in the tribunes. <clears throat> now, um, you know, all of these things will come to play as Roman politics is both reformed and deformed by experiences later on. The equites, or equites, is just sometimes pronounced. That word simply means knight. And it, just like, like many other languages, it comes from the word for horse, equus. Right? Now, they're not patricians, but they were sort of a middle class, not quite a middle class, but... Um, they tended to be educated, wealthy, and, and function more like patricians, but they weren't of the highest families, and, and, and they weren't really the same as the plebes either. Right? So it's kind of an in-between. Right? And there's the, the balance here between the consuls, who, as the image kind of indicates, is sort of monarchical power, versus the senate, the aristocrats, or oligarchy power, or the assembly, the democratic power of the people, right? And it strains between them that, that, that inform and drive a lot of the reforms that Rome had to, had to go through, a little bit like what we've seen with Athens. Right? Um, a major aspect of Roman society is the Roman legions, the Roman armies. Right? <clears throat> and they, they're important in driving um, political experience as well as the glories that develop of Rome as it ends up developing a, quite a big empire. Right? Now, the, you know, how is this so fundamental to Rome? Well, recall we said that that the Romans understand themselves from that origin in Romulus to be defenders of home, right? Remember, Vesta is the goddess of the hearth, and that's the warm heart of the beating heart of the household, right? So the Romans are defenders of the home, and, you know, the Vestal virgins are sacred, sacred to the Romans, right? But they're also mighty in the army. Right? They, they, they're sons of Mars, like Romulus. Right? So you know, these legends inform the Romans, that, that's what the nature of this kind of legendary language tells them, you know, who they are as a people, right? Um, it, the, the, the phrase SPQR, the abbreviation, stands from Senatus Populusque, Populusque Romanus, and the Senate and people of Rome. Okay? And this, it, to this day, you'll see it even on the manhole covers in Rome, it's, it becomes a kind of, an emblem of their people, especially in the Republic. Because the fact is, what makes Rome Rome really is established in the Republic. They, they remember their history is with seven kings, but mostly as a cautionary tale. You know, they have later, you know, grand, you know, rulers as emperors. But what really makes Rome Rome is the Republic. And so they maintain this kind of phrase, S-P-Q-R. Right? Now, when we're looking at Roman expansion, right, from the founding of the Republic, you recall, you know, Rome had been founded first in 753 B.C. Right? You remember that date, 753 B.C. This is 250 years later that Rome's becoming a republic, and it's not very big. Right? It, it's a relatively small area that, as we saw when it becomes a republic, was recently dominated enough to have Etruscan kings. Right? But within just about 50 years or so, you know, they've, they've gone from being the, strong, the strongest among the Latin cities you know, in, in a league with them, to forcing the, that Latin League to become a Roman confederation, that, driven by Rome, allied only directly with Rome, not with each other. And that's because the Latin League hadn't protected them when the Gauls came and invaded and sacked the city in 390. And so Rome takes a stronger hand, and in, almost immediately it starts to have a huge effect, because Rome sets up a system, and this is important, a system of alliances where the closest alliance uh, allied members become citizens 
others are, are kind of Romanized. And then the third group, the most distant group, is at least, you know, mutual defense. And so the more Rome wins in, in battles and expands its territory, the more allies they have that they're responsible for at least helping defend. Right? And so that tends to kind of really snowball in terms of Rome's, you could say, sort of accidental being drawn into, accidentally being drawn into conquest. Right? Now, if we take a look back quickly, that's 264 B.C., by 272, Rome is controlling almost all of Italy, right? And so, you know, after hundreds of years of being quite small, you know, after that, sh this new shift into the Roman Confederation has really made Rome quite a local power, right? But after the Punic Wars, they, they're not just a local power. They're the dominant Mediterranean power, right? By the time Julius Caesar is assassinated, they control almost all the Mediterranean coastline, Right? During his successor, Augustus's reign, before the end of the reign, they controlled all the coastline directly or indirectly. By the, the greatest extent, and that's within 100 years or so, they fully control the whole coastline and more. Right. So this kind of you know, massive expansion is partly you know, something that Rome finds itself falling into. Right? But it's, you know, it's, it's part of the genius of who they were as a people and part of the terror of who they were as a people. And... Part of what's in, in, is inescapable for Roman history. All right, but that's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, all right, for a second year. Let's take a look back at the actual Punic Wars themselves, all right? Rome goes from being a, a very important Italian power, the de dominant Italian power, but through its alliances dragged into conflicts with, you know, through the Greeks that they're now their allies in the south, in Magna Graecia, and other Greeks that are in the island of Sicily. Right. And another power that's local that's being brought into that conflict in Sicily is Carthage. And now at first they're both brought in by, by Sicilian groups of different sorts. But it becomes really clear that the real rivalry that, that's going to be inescapable here is that between Rome and Carthage. Right. As, as that develops. And Rome is has a great army. But they don't have any naval power to speak of. And Carthage runs a maritime empire all, all up and down the Mediterranean. And so it's kind of an imbalanced situation here where, frankly, Carthage has the advantage, right? <clears throat> now, in the First Punic War, um, Rome had to, had to make up for that somehow. And they, you know, by capturing the Carthaginian ship and copying it, building a first navy, it sank, building a second navy, they develop a, a, a strong naval power. <clears throat> in fact, they come up with the clever ideas like this bridge here that is called, I believe, the Crow that would... That they would swing it down with this spike that would into a, a neighboring ship, and then fight what's basically a land battle on ship decks. Right? That there was an innovative way of, of fighting at sea. Most of the time before, the Greeks and others would simply try to ram each other or set fire to each other. <clears throat> this was this was an innovative technique. Right? But by the Second Punic War, I mean the First Punic War was over Sicily, and though um, Hannibal's father <clears throat> never lost Sicily, <clears throat> excuse me. In battle, he was forced to give up Sicily in treaty at the end, uh, which embittered him, that, and and he made Hannibal swear an oath of ha eternal hatred for Rome as a little boy. And so, in the Second Punic War, you know Hannibal, a great military genius, um, really brought things almost to the point of total destruction for Rome. And he, you know, he swept into Rome across the Alps, bringing war elephants, and you know making allies of any other Roman Roman rivals that he could, um, defeating Rome left and right in the battlefield, you know, chasing Roman armies all around Italy, um, you know, getting up to the gates of Rome. Right? Um, eventually, though, the Scipio family, and this is not just Africanus, but his father and uncle as well, you know, really started taking the fight to the Carthaginians, and Scipio himself is able to finish up their work and by taking Carthaginian Spain, and, you know, they already had Sicily and eventually taking the fight to the Carthaginians themselves, where he defeats, soundly defeats Hannibal at Zama, which is just outside Carthage itself. Right. And in the Third Punic War, which in some ways is, a, a, you know, it was kind of an unfortunate event, frankly, and a trumped up sort of thing. Uh, his grandson, Africanus, who got that name because of his victory at Zama in Africa. Right. Um, 
it, it is given the, the, the place name as a t honorific title. It's a rare thing in Roman history. So Africanus Major, right, as he's called then at that point, um, his grandson becomes Africanus Minor by completely wiping out Carthage. I mean, literally burn, you know, calling the gods out of the city, burning down everything, um, it, and you know, not letting any stone stand on another stone, sowing salt in the fields. I mean, as radical an unfounding of a city as you can have. Right? So it had become that extreme for the Romans. Right? But by that time, as we've seen, you know, Rome is now not only the major power in Italy, but it's the major power in the Mediterranean. It doesn't rule the whole thing, but it, it's it's it, no one can really ri fully rival the Romans at that point. Right? Now, what are some other areas of Roman cultural dominance and, and real genius? I mean, one, roads, definitely. I mean, other empires in the past, previous to the Romans had built roads. No one had built roads on this kind of scale or really to this kind of quality. A lot of the roads in Rome, I mean, this is the Appian Way that, I mean, this is a modern photograph. I mean, you can, many sections of Roman road are still very serviceable. Um, a number of sections of Roman road are the, the foundational you know, portions of a, a lot of Europe's highways today. And the Romans were, were better at building good, solid, durable roads than really any other civilization had been before them. Right? <clears throat> uh, but, of course, Roman engineering went beyond that. I mean, a major, uh, majorly important development was the ability to get water from mountain streams and, you know, way, you know, from very distant places, uh, carrying that water across these aqueducts into cities. It's the only thing that, that, that allowed Rome to grow as big as it did because no other city had become this big um, in history and before, and none would become this big again um, until about 1800, London equaled a million people. Right? Rome had between one and possibly two million people in, in antiquity, and no city again would reach that level, as I said, until 1800, right? just, just a little more than 200 years ago. Right, uh, you know, building amphitheaters, which of course modern stadiums are designed in replication. Right, but the Colosseum, for example, as you see in this depiction, it was designed so they could pump in water and have fake naval battles, right? mock naval battles. You know, the Circus Maximus, which would hold about five times as many people as the Colosseum, and it was, you know, it's you notice the design. It's a racetrack, but it's not that dissimilar from the kinds of you know designs we might have for a football stadium or for that matter, you know, racetracks as well. Right? And, you know, they, like the Greeks, they also had this style of theater, right, designed for, for plays. They were great at building temples, right? But typically, and as it's true with most things for the Romans, a lot more practical, right? Here you see, you know, things look similar to a Greek temple, but notice in the back, these these aren't really pillars. They're called pilasters, and there's more interior space, and it's kind of a building built so it can kind of snug up against its neighbors. It's not a single thing like say the, the Parthenon standing way out and, and you know the small interior section. You know they they were they were great at building things out of cement and brick, and then facing it with marble. Right? Um, Augustus famously said he found Rome a city of brick and left it a city of marble. So. A lot of this kind of classical thing is imitating and is learning from and developing off of what the Greeks had done. Right? Um, uh, with the, this structure, the Parthenon, which is one of the one of the best preserved ancient buildings, really the best preserved ancient building, mostly because it became a church soon after um, the, the advent of Christianity being legal in Rome. You know, this is a modern picture of the inside ceiling. Um, and this building is really the mother dome of all buildings in European and, and subsequent world history. It, it's, it, this is a cement poured dome with no reinforcement, and yet, and by the way, an open top, um, that it still survives after almost 2,000 years. Right? <clears throat> and it's, uh, it's it's grand architecture, uh, it, the practical becoming the beautiful. Right? So it's uh, it, the, the Romans were great engineers, they were great at law. They were great at governance. They were great at uh, absorbing new people and Romanizing them at the same time as letting them hold on to as much as possible of their own culture, at least at first. So they, the, the Roman talent for Romanizing and governing and holding things together is in some ways much stronger than the Greek. 
All right, but strangely, the Rome gained its empire and territory when it was a republic. But by growing that empire, it killed the republic. Right? And how does how does that work? Well, it's largely because of the fact that it produced a lot of problems and a lot of strain. You know, a city state used to be governing itself is not quite the same. It's not it isn't the same thing as a group that's ready to govern far flung nations and far flung peoples that are so different. And frankly, all these wars kept causing some real problems that needed solving. And many times, you know, the, the great men and the reforms that they tried to come up with were well meant, uh, well intentioned, not always. Sometimes it was, you know, military men simply trying to capitalize on, on their reputation and gain more power or gain more wealth, or sometimes it was a mixed bag. But these great men and these great reforms, these innovations, these breaking of the traditions of the Republic, ended up breaking it to the point that it couldn't be fixed. Right? It started with the Gracchi brothers. These are grandsons of Scipio Africanus, who were soldiers themselves and saw that a lot of the common Roman soldiers, who frankly, you know, they're not paid. They were they were called to duty, and they had to leave their farms and come back. When they finally came back, if they came back, they, they, many would discover that the farm had been lost. That they didn't have any land, and you know, so they were sort of destitute. And here they had, they had sacrificed or risked themselves for their state, and, and you know, retreated thanklessly afterwards. So what they wanted to do was take land and give to the farmers, right? But once again, we see you know, land reform is the most radical. And who's the one, besides what group has the land? Well, it's the other senatorial class who've been buying up cheap land. And they have, you know, massive, massive latifundia, they call them, or plantations. Right? So the, uh, they, what the Gracchi brothers decide to do, not both together, but one and then later the other, is become tribunes, meaning becoming the protective group uh, becoming an officer who is a protector of the plebes. It, in other words, the patricians look at these these highly honored patricians and say, you're a traitor to our class, right? But they become tribunes to use the particular powers of tribunes to force through these reforms. And so it makes reform a hostile thing um, in, in Rome. And both of them end up being assassinated for it, but the reforms stick, right? Now, Gaius Marius, who himself is... A new man, they call him, meaning he's the first man who rose in his family to, to the senatorial class. Right? Um, he made his first name by by military innovations, right? And he he turned the army, he transformed the army. He made the army into what, what's called Marius's mules. You know, they, where they the soldiers would have to carry their own equipment, but that way they would be tougher and they wouldn't rely on a baggage train that would slow them down. And they could they could be much more maneuverable, much more responsive to the situation. And stronger, and he also did another thing you would think is obvious. He started paying them, which they loved. But what this did was, it made the soldiers more loyal to generals than to the state, and that would have serious consequences when you pair it together with his other ambition. And that is, he used his military reputation to gain political power. In fact, he was elected consul seven times. Nobody else was ever elected consul seven times. Now you might think, well, military power to political power, that seems suspicious. Well, George Washington was a general before he was president. You know, the winner the, the winning general of almost every big American war has become president. You know, Eisenhower was the the highest commander for America and the Allies in the, in, in Europe during World War II. Grant was the highest the, the highest general in the Civil War and he became president. Right? So it's not at all uncommon that this this kind of thing would happen. The question is how it gets used. And by having himself elected consul seven times, that broke all kind of traditions for of, of limited power in the Republic. That's the whole point of having consuls for only one year. Here he's getting himself elected seven times. And the fact is he wasn't as good a political leader as he was a military leader. Right? And so the one who follows him is Sulla, his, uh, a, who had been a military underling of his, right? and a, sort of a lieutenant of his. But then... Marius tried to come back to power, and it ended up becoming an, a, a pitched battle between Marius and his followers versus Sulla and his followers. In other words, the Roman army fighting the Roman army. Right? And so polit political rivalry becoming a military struggle. Right? Now, Sulla won out in this, but 
in the process, he ends up creating this tradition of, of prescription lists where he's posting a list of, of his political enemies that are going to, that have forfeited their lives and their property. Right? And what eventually happens, the obvious thing is that this is a, a huge source of corruption and people start getting their names put on prescription lists just because somebody on, that, that Sell is friends with, you know, wants, is envious of the property and wants the property that belongs to somebody who could be called a rival, right? Uh, Sulla does reestablish the cursus honorum, the path of honors. In other words, the principle that you should hold a small office to learn how to be, you know, in your in political life before you hold a bigger one, which is a long tradition there and elsewhere, right? But he uses terror to reestablish order. And so this doesn't really solve that much of a problem, right? Uh, in the end, his, his followers, Pompey and Crassus, Pompey, more of a follower than, than uh, more of a underling, military underling than Crassus, um, team up together to rig the system again for power. And they break the Corsus Honorum, despite the fact that Sulla just reestablished it, and they get each other elected consul together. And so they're making it kind of a team, right? And Crassus, you know, Pompey had military fame, Crassus had vast wealth, right? And eventually they bring in Julius Caesar into their mix and, and form the first triumvirate, right? Now, triumvirate means three men, right? But it's sort of a shadow government. It's they, they, they each have official roles of various sorts at various times, but there's sort of a secret pact behind the scenes to control everything else, right? And th it's the nature of the corruption that has entered the Republic through huge wealth and power that comes with new, new territories and the, the ability to tax them and the ability to get wealthy off of them. And the desire to, to get in a position where it puts you in a, in a place to be able to make a profit off of it, right? So, and, you know, if you're an honorable man, you know, it's hard to compete with the less honorable ones do, you know, playing this kind of a game with the colonies and the taxation, right? So, you know, Caesar is brought into the mix and they form the first triumvirate, right? But then when Caesar ends up conquering all of Gaul, and Crassus, in the attempt at trying to get some military glory for himself, dies in the east. It, it you know, it's like a three-legged stool that loses one with one leg. It, it's imbalanced. And Pompey and Caesar go go from being allies to rivals. Right? Um, you know, the famous quote Vini Vini Vici is here. This is what Caesar said when he, you know, after having conquered uh, all of Gaul, or we call it France. Right? And and by the way, notice writing about his conquest in such detail, sending reports back to Rome. Another great press that he's writing for himself, and but I mean, his writing is still some of the best Latin and used. You know, it's it's a great traditional classic of Latin literature, right? So, but at the same time, it's propaganda written by himself to make himself popular in Rome, and it worked, right? He became really the central figure of Roman history, right? Um, but and why? Well, the Julian clan, his clan. You know, descended, claimed descent from Eulus, the son of Aeneas, right? And of course, Aeneas's mother is Venus, so he, they claim this divine descent, right? His his name, his 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 family name, Caesar, Caesar, becomes the name for emperor, right? Of all later European empires, they're all called Caesar. Whether it's the Romans at first being adopted into the family as a direct you know, last name. But later Roman emperors that aren't at all adopted into the family still use the title, the name as a title, Caesar. The German Empire, when it gets created, they call what do they call their emperors? Kaiser. The Russian, Tsar. And it's spelled this way, as we see here. Uh, but in, in these days, you'll see T-S-A-R. But it, this way shows you a little bit better what it means. It means Caesar. Right? It, it, the na just the name Caesar becomes the meaning of the word emperor. Right? And so, you know... Julius Caesar himself is sort of the pivot point from all of the different traditions of Rome. His family is one of the oldest Roman families, right? To the future of what Rome means around the world. I mean, there really is no more famous Roman than Julius Caesar, right? You know, in the first triumvirate, he's the last man standing. As these allies become rivals, you know, he chases Pompey out uh, off into Egypt, and though Pompey's killed before he can catch up to him, you know, he's the last man holding all the power. And in the second triumvirate. It's only formed by, by followers of his who are trying to kind of make their name off of his legacy, right? Now, here we see in the depiction, Caesar crosses the Rubicon. Because at that point in time, what's, what's the Rubicon? Well, it's a little stream that was considered the boundary of Italy proper from
from the northern areas that Rome was controlling. And for a military conqueror, a governor of a territory, to come back in and bring his army back into the, inside the boundaries of Italy was considered an act of war. And so when Caesar did that, he felt like, you know, he, he could either leave his army there and walk into the trap of Pompey and the Senate, or he could bring his army with him and immediately, you know, create a war. And so he brought his army with him and he said, the die is cast. You know, here I'm rolling the dice. Let's we'll see how it works out. Right. <clears throat> so, it, you know, very famous episode. Right. So um, after, you know, the glories of Caesar, you know, we hit, you know, he famously, you know, kept grabbing and pretty flamboyantly grabbing really unlimited power, eventually declaring himself dictator for life. He had already been, been Pontifex Maximus since he was quite young. He, you know, there are all kinds of glories so that anyone who's, who, who was really concerned about the Republic and some men who were just concerned about power thought he wanted to be king or definitely thought he could be accused of it. Right. So, and so on the Ides of March, a group of senators assassinated him. And, you know, some of them were friends of his. They were convinced that it was their duty to Rome to get rid of the tyrant, right? Seek semper tyrannis. This is going right back to the founding of the Republic. And the descendant of that Brutus was one of, was, was one of the assassins and was a friend of Caesar's, right? But felt that it was his honorable duty to get rid of this, this, this functional tyrant, right? And defend the Republic. And it was, you know, very famously... The, the the very important goal of all the other conspirators to make sure Brutus was one of them because it was too symbolic an act. And, you know, why do they kill him? What do they assassinate? What's the goal? They're they're reenacting the founding of the Republic to try to at least appear to you know be protecting the Republic against the tyrant. The fact is, the Republic had really been dead for a hundred years because we've seen these great men and all their breaking of different traditions. The Republic had. It'd been strained too far and broken too too much to really survive. And so now the the Cicero, the great last defender of the Republic, the most famous Roman orator, the the, the best Roman Roman stylist, you know, it was really fighting in many ways a losing battle. He was a very honorable man, but fighting a losing battle. In the first triumvirate, you know, his response was to side with Pompey. And because he felt like he was siding with the Senate, of course, that's the side that lost. But Caesar, who was his friend, at least on and off in a certain sense, probably more friendly to Cicero than vice versa, um, than Cicero was to him, it, Caesar forgave him. But with the second triumvirate, when he sided against Antony and in favor of Octavian, because they were co conflicting at first, right? Who, you know, who, who was the real heir of Caesar, right? Octavian ends up letting Antony take him and murder him because Cicero had written strongly against Antony and it hugely insulted him, right? And so to, to form the alliance between Octavian and Antony of the Second Triumvirate, he ends up letting Cicero go. And Cicero was, was killed, his head chopped off, his tongue that had spoken against Antony nailed to the rostra where people would speak in the Roman Forum. Pretty brutal. Right. Now in the Second Triumvirate, who, who do we have? Um, you know, Before, we had Pompey, Crassus, and Caesar. Now we have heirs of Caesar. Right. Octavian, who was his... His sister's grandson, his great nephew, right, and was only 18 when Caesar was killed, you know, and and only found out when Caesar was killed that he was had been adopted as Caesar's son because Caesar had had a lot of wives and was a famous lech in terms of that kind of activity, but didn't have any legitimate children, and so in his will he adopted Octavian as his as his son, right? Mark Antony, who was Caesar's protege, it really had served directly under him. It was his kind of political partner, so to speak, being trained up the line. Right. And, you know, and really thought of himself as his political and military heir and Lepidus, who had also served under Caesar. Right. So they band together. At first, there's tension between Octavian and Anthony because they see ultimately they're going to become rivals. But it, but then they realize, well, if they fight it out with each other, it's it's the conspirators who assassinated Caesar who went out. Right. So they they, they team together. They bring Lepidus into the mix and they, they fought the conspirators, chased them down, got rid of them and then divided up power in Rome. And it worked for a while until Antony ends up divorcing the sister of Octavian in order to marry Cleopatra. And at least according to the reports, when Octavian gets the Vestal Virgins to show him the will of Antony, it appears that he you know, wants to give over the eastern part of the Roman Empire to the children of Cleopatra. And this spells war. Now, now whether that will was legit or not, it's, it's going to be impossible to know. But 
it, it basically, like with the first train of Brit, you know, a, one Lepidus died and was gotten out of the way, and the other two of the three become rebels, right? And so at the Battle of Actium, the forces of Octavian meet up with Antony and Cleopatra's combined navy, and Octavian trounces them. The Battle of Actium, 31 BC, and you know they they run away. In fact, it's it's unknown why, but they ran away back to Egypt, and he chased them down to Egypt. And by the time he got there, you know she had committed suicide. I think they both had committed suicide. Um, right. So you know, Octavian is left as the sole ruler, right? And within a few years, he's been given the title Augustus as, as emperor. Now we uh, the, the, the the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Is what comes from this, and Rome. It, they don't really. He's, he's cagey and wise. He avoids a lot of the excesses of his great uncle Julius Caesar. He he ends the internal wars that Rome had been having, been plagued with for centuries. He rules his first citizen. He pretends that the republic is still alive. He won't hold an office for for too long. He'll give it up and he'll hold a different kind of office and have other people elected. But the fact of the matter, he's got the power strings in his hand behind the scenes for everything. Right? He, he, he tries to encourage Roman virtues. He even taxes families that don't have enough children. Um, he, he encourages people to, to dress more modestly and simply. You know, all these Republican simple, simple virtues as these wealthy, luxurious Romans go around, you know, you know, really not being that interested in doing such things. Right? He's, he's not really trying to encourage that, but his own family's falling apart with, 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 with vice and, and, you know, not really following the, that line either. Right. He encourages art that glorifies Rome, you know, from the histories of Livy, you know, famous histories of Livy, to the, you know, the poetry of Virgil, like, such as the Aeneid. You know, it's all about the, the, how, how Aeneas came over from Troy and you know, fled the destruction of Troy to eventually found this, the, the, the Roman people. Right? But, uh, you know, and, and leaves, you know, found, as he said, found Rome a city of brick and leaves it a city of marble. But He's, you know, there's only so much he can do, and there's only so much that 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 kind of, you know, nobility in what he's trying to encourage really kind of sticks. And you can very much see that with his successors. Now they're called Julio Claudians because by blood they're Claudian. They're really the descendants of his wife Livia, not of Jul not of uh, Augustus, right? But they're they're his sons by adoption, right? And well, sons or descendants by adoption. You get Tiberius, who is the actual son of his wife. All right. And then you get you know, skipping two generations down to Caligula, then coming back to Claudius, who had been hidden, frankly. And, you know, he had a stammer and a limp and he was he was sort of a, you know, he was a, a, a mark of shame in the family. They didn't really get him, let him see, get seen very often. But by the time it got to Claudius, most of that that those generations had been. You know, killed off in intrigues or poison or murder or war, and you know, and in fact, Caligula had been killed by his own Praetorian Guard, is the elite military unit de designated for protecting emperors, right? <clears throat> and you know, Claudius was was killed by by his wife, who was also his niece, and she killed him for the sake of her own son Nero becoming emperor, right? And you know, so you have you know a, a paranoid kind of perverted, uh, you know. Uh, power power mongering, but a little bit more stable than some others. You know, two complete psychopaths, and and one who turned out to be a better emperor than most people expected. Right? It, it, it's a very mixed bag where it comes to them. Right? Now, many people would say that that Rome had simply become too big to rule. Right? And so eventually, and pretty soon, it you know the, the habit was to break it into segments. I mean, sometimes two, principally two, east and west. Right? Sometimes as many as four under the Tetrarchy, but we don't have to get into all those details, right? The, the fact is, though, as they start to do this, they tend to, the emperors start to pay more attention to the East. Why? Well, it's the, the older civilizations. There are more people there. There's more wealth there. And so there's a lure to, to paying more attention to those Eastern territories. And the West, including the city of Rome, gets gets neglected. And But Rome also had become violent. You know, a lot of people who had no work, no jobs, they would end up gravitating towards the city of Rome, where all roads led. And it, the emperors start to realize it's a little safer to stay away from Rome, to rule from other places, right? Much like Constantine. You know, he, he, he becomes emperor in a, in a battle, the Milvian Bridge, there for Rome. But by, the, by just a few years later, when he's legalizing Christianity, he's issuing that edict from Milan, from the north of Italy. 
right? The later on he founds an eastern capital. He calls it Nova Roma, New Rome, in the place of old Byzantium. Now, where is that? Well, it's it's right here where the Mediterranean enters into the Black Sea, right, at the Bosporus. But in this old Greek, he, he realizes the strategic importance of this place, this Greek colony, and he founds a new, what he calls New Rome, and a later people call Constantine City, right, Polis, Constantine. Constantinopolis, or we call it Constantinople. Okay. He founds it actually to replace Rome. Um, now, eventually what ends up happening is that Rome is the western capital, Constantinople is the eastern capital, um, but that's not exactly what he was doing at the moment. Right? Now, Constantine favored and, and showered favors on Christianity throughout his life and reign, but he only became Christian himself. He was only baptized at his death. Why? Well, emperors were automatically the... the Pontifex Maximus. He, he made Christianity legal, but he didn't force Christianity on the whole empire. That would be, it would come later that Christianity was made the official religion, but, but, but he didn't do that. You'll hear many, many people, people ought to know better, saying that he, he made it the official religion of the empire. And that, that's actually not true. Um, it, within 100 years, it would happen, but not yet. Right. Now, eventually, and not that much later, in 476 AD, right, remember that. Founded 753, falling in 476. Rome falls. It's Rome in the west that falls, though, to the Germanic tribes, not in the east. The eastern empire lives on for almost a thousand years more. In fact, until from 476 to 1453, that eastern Roman empire lives on. The people, <clears throat> they keep calling themselves Romans, even though they speak Greek when they're doing it. Right? And until um, just around 40 years before Columbus, right? when they finally fall, when the Ottoman Turks take over Constantinople and rename it Istanbul, right? But that whole period is, you know, it, it's a very kind of different shift. But, it, you know, at least, the, at least the first half of it, they're very self-consciously Roman. They think of themselves as Roman, they call themselves Roman, right? They, they use Latin, but mostly just as an official, you know, legal language, right? The West, though, had been wiped by, by barbarians. However... They're the origins of modern European countries. You have the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes coming in from these northern Germanic areas into England, and that's what produces Anglo-Saxon, which is the origin of the language that we're speaking here, right? English. It, Angle, Angle land becomes England, right? You have, you know, the, the Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Huns, Vandals. This is where we get the, the name Vandal because they were known for being violent. They're swooping down, swooping through North Africa, you know, sieging the city of St. Augustine as he was dying, right? There, there's, you know, uh, this huge migration of, of warlike peoples, but warring tribes that, that would take over the areas. The population mostly stayed the same for, you know, but it was, it was the ruling class that we replaced, right? But that's, you know, that's it in an awfully big nutshell. I'm, I'm sorry, guys, this video has gone on for a while, but there's a lot to talk about. Um, I, you know, let me just reassure you, you're not going to have a really difficult test on Rome. We are going to have a test on Rome, but it's not going to be a hugely difficult one. I do want you to try to know the basics and see the, see the big picture. And I really hope that this video, though it's been very long, has helped you to do that. Um, take care. I, I wish you the best of luck in wrapping up everything for this year. And good luck, and we will see you soon.